Good afternoon, everyone. We're just waiting for some folks to get into the room. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Allison Hurrier, and I head up the textile arts curriculum at Portland State University. For those of you who do or who are joining us from outside of the university today, the textile arts curriculum is an elective track in the BFA art practice program that provides an interdisciplinary approach to the study of clothing and textiles. We offer courses in weaving, surface design, sewn construction, and dress history that encourage students to develop portfolios for applications in fashion, costume, textiles, and contemporary art. This is uh, the final event that we're hosting this term where we're inviting students and the public to come together and engage with outside perspectives that supplement some of our current course, course offerings. Um, we're working to finalize the schedule for next term in the coming week, so stay tuned. Uh, but in the meantime, feel free to visit our website um, to stay posted on upcoming programming and check out our archive. I'll go ahead and post that link in the chat right now. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are joining you all from Portland State University, which is located near the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon, and Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of Chinook, the Tualatin Kayapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. It's my great honor today to introduce Nazanin Hidayat Monroe. Uh, Hidayat Monroe is a New York-based artist, curator, and textile historian. She received her PhD in art history from the University of Bern in Switzerland and MFA in fiber from the Cranbrook, Cranbrook Academy of Art specializing in historical garments and woven textiles from the early Persianite world. She's published two books, book chapters, and several articles with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, as well as several other scholarly journals. Also maintaining an active studio practice, Dr. Hidayat Monroe has exhibited her multimedia installations at museums and galleries across the United States. As she um, and has received national acclaim for her work. Most recently, she's been experimenting with smart textiles or e-textiles that combine her research in, um, with 21st century technology. An NEA grant recipient, her body of work is composed of handmade garments and textile-based installations, exploring and reinterpreting historical textile motifs as expressions of cultural identity. Her studio practice includes silk painting, silk screen, weaving, and surface, surface embellishment. Dr. Hidayat Monroe is the Director of Textile Technology and Assistant Professor, uh, um, Assistant Professor of Business and Technology of Fashion at New York City College of Technology, City University of New York, where she teaches fashion history, textile fabrications, and seminars on contemporary issues in the industry. In 2022, she published two books, A Cultural History of Western Fashion with Bloomsbury Publishing and Sufi Lovers, Safavid Silks and Early Modern Identity with Amsterdam University Press, both exploring the intersection of art and dress in the context of business technology and public image. Nazanin, we are so thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to giving this talk. Um, I really do think it's important as an artist to sort of pause along the way sometimes and look at your whole body of work. So that's the approach that I took for this talk. Um, I will go ahead and start screen sharing, but I'm going to give just a little bit more of a bio, if that's okay. I mean, not work-wise, but just life-wise, because we all are, I think, products of our own life and our work is products of what we experience. Um, so I've had a really broad career in textiles, as I'm sure you gleaned. I started out in the apparel industry. I also worked a stint in the automotive industry. I've lived in New York, Chicago, Detroit, San Francisco. I spent uh, 12 years in California, and now I've been in New York for 12 years. And it's just about that amount of time that I've been out of my MFA. Um, so during that time, I did a lot of different kinds of work. Design is important, I think. For me, it was like always my bread and butter work until I got to the point where I had a full-time academic job, which is now I'm on my fifth year of that. I always taught on the side because I love teaching. 
Um, and I always maintained a studio practice, but as I'm sure you can imagine, it was really busy. Um, and I like to know how things work. So I like to dabble in all sorts of new things. Um, but I'll start a little bit with just kind of uh, my family and, you know, how I ended up being interested in textiles and how, you know, how that's affected all of my work. Um, so my parents are immigrants who came from Iran. They came in the 60s. I was born in Detroit with my brothers and uh, we all grew up in America, but we had a very Persian home. So Persian food, Persian language, Persian music, and growing up with the, these two very special cultures, growing up with American culture and Persian culture, um, I always felt like I was never quite one thing or the other. Now, after all these years, I think that's amazing, but it's really taken me a long time to work through some of that. And you'll see it, I think, in my, in my work and the way that I approached my work. Um, Sorry, my computer's just being flaky. All right, so my connection to Persian culture being somewhat tenuous always made me feel like I wanted to find it. So I titled this lecture in general in search of because I realized I've been searching for something Persian all along the way. Um, and we use the term sort of Persian and Iranian interchangeably. Um, I was born just a couple years before the, the revolution, which was 79. and after that time, you never wanted to say you're Iranian for a long time, like there was a lot of discrimination against that. So we reverted to saying Persian. Persian also references the language and the poetry that comes from modern day Iran. So, um, you know, you hope you'll forgive me if I kind of go back and forth, but that is actually the nature of what happens in our community anyway. So down to textiles. Um, I always loved working with textiles. I started, even as a little kid, I was, you know, writing stories and then I would design clothes for the characters in the stories. And I think that oddly enough, that is what I've been doing over and over for a long time. Um, I grew up with lots of beautiful textiles around the house, Persian rugs and wall hangings and um, really beautiful clothes. My mom was very fashionable all the time. So I always had an interest in fashion and clothing. The game changer for me was uh, going to Cranbrook Kingswood School, which is in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. I grew up in the suburbs just north of Detroit, and I got to go to this amazing private school community. Most people know Cranbrook in the arts through the Art Academy, but they actually have a K through 12 school. And because Cranbrook was founded by uh, Aliel and Loya Saarinen, Aliel was an architect who designed all the buildings for the campus, and Loya was a weaver, a great weaver. And that school actually has the largest weaving studio in North America. So of course I took weaving as an elective. I learned to weave when I was 14 and I was in high school and I absolutely fell in love with it. So this is a really old piece that I'm showing you. I'm not starting with my best work, but I'm starting with some old work and I'll, I've sort of interspersed this talk with the old and the new. So you can see just as students and as an audience, how much the same ideas sort of seem to come back around, I think, for a lot of artists. So my big search, I think, overall was the search for like the mythical Persian garden. I think when you leave a homeland and you essentially never go back, I only went back twice and I'll get to that, I'll come back around to that. Um, it becomes this, this magical, mythical place and it can be kind of whatever you want and it can be fashioned from whatever you think it should be. So for me, you know, Iran was like, this endless garden. And this is what I remembered from the one time I visited in my youth right before the revolution. And um, so I put a Persian miniature here called Dancing Dervishes. This is a pretty famous painting by a Persian master painter called Behzad. These are the types of images that drew me into Persian culture. And my first attempt at trying to respond to this historic work was to make this little tapestry. It's a strip tapestry for those of you who are textile people, and it's done in sumac stitch and it's also embroidered and then it's stitched together in these little panels. And there's a detail here. So these are my Sufi dervishes. The Sufis in Iran are the Islamic mystics and they engage in this performative ritual called Sama in which they're singing and dancing and it leads them to a state of ecstasy. And um, being kind of a closet philosopher and poet, I 
absolutely fall in love with this idea and you hear about this, these references to ecstasy and um, the ecstatic state over and over in Persian poetry. Um, the problem with weaving for me was the size of the loom, the scale of the loom got to be like too small. I mean, this is a little tiny piece. It's like eight by 10 inches. And I, instead of the viewer projecting themselves into the work like you would with a painting or another small piece, I wanted to envelop my viewer in this idea of the garden. So I started working really big. So this is just a year later. I started with these huge silk panels. They're all hand painted with dyes. And um, in the original installation, unfortunately, I don't have photographs of this, but in the original installation, I had those three dancing Sufis and they were like a line drawing, but they were made out of metal and they were hanging from the ceiling in front of each of these panels and they would move. You could touch them, they were hanging on fishing line and they would like do a dance. It was a really funny piece. And um, we had a lot of fun with it. Um, this is when I was at SCAD, I did my BFA at Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, so this is sort of my first attempt at a really big installation piece working with textile. Um, as I mentioned, I only had two visits to Iran that I remember. I mean, I think I went as a baby, but I don't count that because I don't remember. Um, but the first time was 1979. So this is me in Esfahan. And then this is me again in Esfahan in 1995. And these two visits essentially defined my whole understanding of that culture and that world. And um, it was really tough to go back as an adult. I, I went back in between my first and second year at Cranbrook during my MFA. So that was 1995. And I, you know, I really had remembered it as this beautiful blooming garden and this amazing place as a kid. And I went back as an adult and I felt like literally and metaphorically, the gardens had died. And this affected me so profoundly on so many levels that when I came back and started my second year of my MFA, this was all I could think about was like the death of this dream or the death of this memory. And so I, I made this whole series, and this is just part of it, but I made this whole series of like this dying garden uh, just to try and reconcile all of these things. Um, so the piece on the left is called, Do You Think Flowers Can Grow in Asphalt? Um, and the piece on the right is details from an installation called How to Grow a Persian Garden. Um, so these are all made out of hand-dyed silk and surged and you know formed into these sculptural pieces with wire and mixed media. Um, and this is the installation view of How to Grow a Persian Garden. And I made, I really went all out with this. I made like a fake garden manual and I rewrote all the text and I made these little seed packets, which you can, they're actually like right here, like with the real seeds in them. So, um, and the images on there are actually from coffee cup readings because in Persian culture, you drink a little cup of like a really thick espresso and then you flip your cup over and the grounds form images and then you can read the cup. It's like a form of divination. So that's what these images are on top. So I was looking at destiny and I was looking at divination, but mostly I was looking at how am I gonna reconcile this sort of the death of this relationship with my own cultural heritage. And so I came up with, um, you know, with this piece and I sort of worked through it partially in that way. Um, but the ultimate, I think, resolution for me was that I just had to accept that there were, you know, that there was a kind of dilution that happens when you leave your home country or you know, when you have this sort of first generation experience. Um, and so I created this next piece. I always had thought of you know, the mystic dervishes dancing in the garden. So here is the garden without the dervishes and it's called the mystics have fled the garden. So the whole piece is like a small enclosure about 10 feet square and it's made from hand dyed silk and just to show some details, working from Persian miniatures with um, you know, depictions of po poetic narratives, I took those and I manipulated them and I pixelated them. And I, tra I did a CAD transfer. I mean, there was not digital printing per se in the 90s. So I did this like CAD transfer onto silk. And then I wrote a poem in response to the original poem. 
And you'll see these characters of Layla and Majnun come up a lot in my work. They're, uh, it's one of the most powerful epic poems in Persian poetry, um, originally written or codified, I should say, in the 12th century. Um, but Layla and Majnun are these lovers. So I'll, I'll talk more about them. But my idea here was that, you know, essentially the color had gone out of those stories and that what we were left with was, you know, just being on the outside looking in. Um, I love working with silk. Silk is always my favorite material to work with. Um, if you haven't worked with it, it is lustrous and it takes dye really beautifully. And there are so many varieties of silk um, that, you know, most, I think most people don't even know about. Even people in the industry don't realize like the, um, the, the kinds of silk you can use. So I spent a lot of time at Cranbrook just playing around with silk and dye, but I was also trying to capture the essence of Safavid silk. So the Safavids were the period of uh, sort of the golden art of Iranian culture in 16th, 17th century, the best paintings, the most beautiful silks, everything came out of this golden age of art. And so that became my touch point with like, you know, the point in time where things started to decline in a way leading up to the present day, at least for me. So I was introduced to some of these historic silks through an exhibition catalog called Woven from the Soul, Spun from the Heart um, by Carol Beer, which came out of the Textile Museum in the 80s. It was given to me in the mid 90s by Gerhard Nodell, who was my advisor at Cranbrook. And it was literally uh, probably one of the most important moments of my life was getting this catalog and finding this connection with these historic pieces. I had always been looking at Persian art, but I don't think I really fully knew what I was looking at. But even at, you know, on a visual level, I started looking at textiles, depicting textiles. So this is a silk in the middle, and these are this is a drawing I did. I was looking at line, drape, and I was looking at these little details like the frogging on this coat. And um, you know, I just started making sketches and I started working with the colors that I was seeing in these historic silks, just as a, like a giant fleshed out sort of color study. Um, but ultimately that series turned into this. Um, a lot of the, the same pieces of these various installations will come and they will combine and they'll make something new. So here you see the vines from the mystic piece combined with the Safavid color series. Um, and this is from the De Young Museum when I did my artist residency in 2008. Um, in terms of Persian poetry, this has always been a great favorite of mine. Uh, Rumi is one of my favorite poets, but I also like Nezami and Hafez, so you'll see those names kind of pop up a lot. I was uh, generally reading them in English, but if my parents recited the original Persian, then we could go through that together. My Even to this day, my auditory skills are better than my, my written skills in the language, so I can understand it very well if you speak it, but if I have to read it, I'm slower. So um, the audio of that became really important to me, the audio of somebody reading Persian and me being able to listen. And so this idea of a listener will come up here and there in various installations. This installation was inspired by an expression I heard in one of Rumi's famous poems in which he uses this term sabzpush. Sabzpush literally translates as the one adorned in green. And his reference there, because Rumi was a mystic and he was speaking with other mystics essentially, his reference is that uh, is the people in the afterlife who are adorned in garments of green silk. It's a, it's a verse from the Quran. Um, so the thing about the mystic poets is they, they know who they're talking to. And they make these seemingly obscure references, but if you're a theologian or if you're somebody who studied the original works, then you know what those references are. So this was a lot of work though, to try and figure out like what these poets are alluding to. In this particular piece, um, which in Farsi I call Sabz Push, but in English I call this So, this is the afterlife. Um, this is really another piece I think about disappointment and it's about this figure who finds herself in the afterlife and she's really disappointed or disillusioned about what she's found. 
um, and it's arranged so that the figure is behind this silver screen. So when you're looking at her as in the view on the left, it's like looking in a mirror and it's all written in the second person. So that's just my own poetry, again, in response to Rumi and this idea of the, um, the afterlife and the, the things people will experience. Here's a detail of the silk. I had a lot of fun dyeing all those different greens and um, adding all the feathers and everything. So um, there's always a garment and there's always a figure in my work from about this period forward. So um, moving forward with this, with this idea of storytelling and narrative, um, I started to write sort of my own story fashioned after other people's stories. And so in one version of my life, I was telling the story of myself as a fairy tale. And I turned that initial idea into a pretty full-blown installation. This is a performative still. Um, I made all the garments. And then in the story, the, the princess, if you will, goes into a forest on a quest and she gets lost and she has to climb to the top of the highest hill and she has to stitch a map of the forest to figure out how to get out and you know she doesn't have paper and pen so she stitches it on her skirt so that's what we're looking at in these details is the embroidery on the skirt that was all freehand embroidery on silk um and then the actual installation looks like this i had these huge panels of organza, which was block printed and um, covered in a vinyl lettering that I adhered with adhesive. And so that sort of represented like the, the ephemeral words of the story, if you will. And then I had the forest. And this came, you know, I, I usually show my work in several different places. So this is like the first installation of this work. Later I made the installation, so it was like, a tunnel and you were walking through the words of the story and the, the forest was sort of like surrounding you. So it depends on the space. One thing that's good and also bad about installation is that it's never the same twice. Um, in another sort of version of me telling my life story, I had to, I was still sort of back in the forest. You can see I'm a big nature lover and um, I had to, find a way to camouflage myself in order to uh, sort of protect myself from predators. And so in this story, I, you know, the, the princess, if you will, stitches herself a bark dress and she makes herself an ivy cloak so she can blend into the forest. So that's what um, a lot of this was about. So this is also freehand embroidery. And then I use this sort of a combination of real and fake leaves. And this is another performative still. Um, but back to the idea of like Persian poetry, which is really where I always end up. Um, I was interested in this recurring theme that we see over and over again, which is the theme of the absent beloved. There is a voice in Persian poetry. There's just an overall voice in all of it where there's this longing and it's an earthly longing and it's a divine longing. So it's sort of sacred and profane at the same time. And it's very powerful and it's very almost visceral. You can really like, you can almost hear them crying when you read this poetry, if you read it in the right tone. And so um, I wanted to capture the essence of that absence, the, like where is the absent beloved and how would they be? So I set up like a little altar place in this installation with pomegranates, which are the fruit of love. Um, and that's actually pomegranate juice, but it's supposed to be wine. Um, and this, these little goblets and like when you as the viewer approach the absent beloved, who's the figure outlined in green, you see the poetry longing for the absence of the lover. Um, and, you know, I usually work from some kind of painted image. So that's what this is. This is the outline of that little figure, just for reference. Uh, but the best poetry for me is the one where it's not just a single poem or a qasida, it's actually an epic narrative. And um, my favorites are the narratives about the lovers, uh, Leila and Majnun. And there are a couple of other interesting lovers that come up as well. And these are all real people, by the way. This isn't like fiction that these poets are writing about. There was a real Majnun and there was a real Leila. The word Majnun means crazy or madman because the 
the lovers were separated by their families who didn't want them to be together. This happened around the seventh century. So this is like way before Romeo and Juliet and the sort of love stories that we think of when we think of separation. I think it even predates, you know, Tristan and Isolde and a lot of those other stories. So this was another tale where I thought, how could I create the garments that these people would wear? This is also highly inspired by um, historical study. By 2006, I was just finishing my master's in um, Islamic art. So after I finished my MFA, I went back to school in 2004. I got an MA in Islamic art and architecture, and then I did my PhD later. But I was looking at these Safavid silks because they had never left me from the time I had found them, if you will. So this is one of them. This is a red silk velvet. And this is a scene from the story of Layla and Majnun. It's Layla going to visit Majnun in the desert because you know he basically goes insane. He leaves society and he's like wandering nude in the desert. And he has all these sympathizers because even though he's gone crazy, he is still able to compose this very beautiful poetry. And so he has these sympathizers who will come and visit him and they'll tell him that, oh, Layla's been thinking of you and she misses you. And in this particular version of the story, she goes to the desert to visit him. So that's what we're looking at here is my version of like, what would that performance look like? And each of the characters are wearing their own character. So this is Layla wearing a picture of herself. And in the next slide, here is Majnun wearing a picture of himself. And I'll show you some details as well. So this is a whole, um, it's like an animated GIF when you look at all of these photographs together. And um, they go through this cycle of, you know, she's ignoring him and then she starts to get interested in him and she's tugging on the sleeve, which represents his words of poetry. And uh, the words that are printed on there are from Nezami's version of the story from the 12th century. Majnun says to Layla, I wish I was the dust under your feet so I could be close to you when you step on me and scatter me to the wind. And her words are from what she says in the story, um, she dies before he does and she's really miserable because they've never united. And she says, color my captain red because truly I'm dying a martyr. Meaning, you know, I never got to be with my lover. Very romantic stuff. So they become entwined, but they end up separate in my series of photographs. And so these are just some views of, you know, some of those images. And here are some details of Majnun's robe. Um, I called the piece Permanent Madness. It's a little bit of a, it's not an exact translation, but there's an expression that came up when I was researching this and the expression that I heard in a song from a poem that was being done in song was sel sele jonunam, which means I am the continuity of madness, or more poetically, I am the permanent madness. And I was just really struck with this idea of, you know, the permanence of madness and the separation of the beloved. Um, and here is the image. Um, this is a Safavid drawing from the seven, early 17th century, around 1600. And that was um, what I was looking at when I was designing my Majnun. The deer is always a proxy for Layla because in Nezomi's version, Majnun goes into the wilderness and he um, becomes like a beast master, almost like a Solomonic figure. And he he gathers all these wild animals who would normally be attacking him, but they're so sympathetic to him. Beasts um, become his pets in a way. And his favorite pet is the deer. And usually you'll see the deer sitting in his lap and she's a proxy for Layla. He always refers to Layla as Ahoyiman or like my deer or my doe, my doe-eyed deer, if you will. Um, so in a final sort of manifestation of this idea, I flipped the paradigm because the focus is always on the man, let's face it. You know, it's Persian culture. It's very male, very, very patriarchal and male oriented. And I thought, well, what about Layla? What was she doing while he was out there suffering in the wilderness and everybody was sympathizing with him? She was separated from him too. 
So my feeling was I'm going to totally flip that. So you can see here, I have no Majnun here and Layla is in this tent. And the, the figure of Layla is provided with all of these writing implements. And um, this was total improv, by the way, it was like live performance art in the Museum of Quilts and Textiles. But we laid it out into phases. And in the first phase, Layla was writing notes. I played the part of the intermediary because that's kind of how I see myself. I see myself as an intermediary between those characters and the present day. And the audience came in, I had them write notes to Layla. I gave them notes from Layla. I pinned her notes on this curtain that we had that was made out of sand. And um, in phase two, I brought people to come and speak with her. And in phase three, I took her around and I was holding her skirt and she went and she distributed sweets to all of the audience members. One of the things that I always think about when I'm making an installation, whether it's performative or not, is what can my viewer take away? How can they contribute and how can they take something home? Because I don't want um, anything I make to be totally self-contained. I feel like you have to literally and meta you know, metaphorically bring the viewer into what you're doing. And so um, it turned out to be such a moving sort of event. I thought people were just gonna walk in and walk out and people came in and they sat there for two hours through the whole um, performance. And um, we heard a, a lot of really great feedback. And then, you know, later we edited it into a short film. I didn't bring the, you know, the film to share today, but if you ever want it, I can send the link and you can take a look at it. Um, and then later when I went to the De Young, which was about a year and a half later, I showed the film alongside the garment. So here you can see the backdrop curtain, which was um, filled with sand. So these little edges you see here, I sewed these channels. I filled it with sand and pearls from this Persian metaphor of the pearls of poetry, the sand of course being Majnun's desert. And um, there were sand in the little wine glasses. So all sorts of metaphor. While I was at the De Young, in addition to having sort of a retrospective exhibition, I also made a new piece and it was inspired by a piece in their collection, which was um, these confronting goats in a pearl roundel. So this is a, a very old icon of the roundel that um, has these little pearls surrounding it. I decided to go for more of a Persian reference. So even though the roundel was used really from like Persia all the way to China, all across, you know, um, Asia, uh, the Persian sort of use of that is always coupled with this mythological creature called a simur. And the simur is um, this bird feline creature that helps all of the legendary Iranian kings in our folklore. So um, I was really thinking about like, how your clothing is your identity. And when you have certain icons and you're displaying them, you not only tell people who you are, but they start to function as a bit of a talisman. And um, so this is the beginning of me thinking also of clothing as a talisman. Around the edge, this whole border was empty to begin with. Um, this is my original Seymour, by the way, it came from a metal plate, but it was also seen on a textile. Uh, yes, so the audience piece for this was that I created all these black and white drawings from different um, pearl roundel textile imagery. So I had these confronting ducks and I had a rooster and I had um, deer and I had some goats. And these are my parents over here <laughs> who came to visit me. And uh, I had everyone who came into the space, which was right almost at the entry of the De Young, usually sat down and they colored one of these. I think I had a few hundred of them by the end of a month. So I had all from little kids to artists who would come into the museum to muse just regular museum goers and everyone made these and they were able to then insert them in these little pockets that I made. So that was them contributing to the work. And I rotated them. I had so many that, you know, like I didn't have enough space for all of them. So I rotated them throughout the exhibition and they kind of, some of them were on the wall, uh, but it, it was really a nice piece. It was a nice element. I did a kid's workshop while I was there and I taught them how to paint on silk. It was lots of fun. 
that was really a great experience. And those two museum pieces were sort of the beginning of my working with museum museums. Um, so going back just a little bit in time, but introducing another concept that comes up a lot in my work, this idea of, you know, what is marriage in Persian culture? Like most cultures in Persian culture, your parents are gonna have to basically pick your spouse or approve of your spouse. And for me, this was a really overwhelming concept as a 21 year old. <laughs> um, and so I started questioning what all of these things meant. So I created essentially a fake wedding for my very first installation at Cranbrook. And I wove the wedding cloth, which is here, but I started in interspersing these sort of Americanized elements of traditional Persian things. So I had some things in Persian, like you can see on the mirror, there's a little sign that says, you know, I hope you're happy and it's covered with paisleys. I made that wireframe. Um, and, but then the Quran is in English and I created it as a live event. I created invitations, I made them by hand, I delivered them to everyone in my department and other departments. And I invited everyone to come and sit down like it was a real wedding. And of course the wedding was between my two cultural selves. It was, I am American to I was Iranian. Um, and so uh, when people came, I served them tea and I served them cookies and they looked down at their plate and they realized that the doily had a line of poetry. So everyone read their line of poetry and it came into this whole poem and it was all about really the angst of trying to figure out this huge life decision, um, you know, at such a young age. Um, and then when they left, I documented sort of the residue of that experience and I did a whole series of drawings and, um, and that led to another series of installations where everything kind of happened on the floor and then the drawings of the old thing went up on the walls. So this went on for a while, um, but really it was another manifestation of me trying to figure out this aspect of what it meant to be Persian and how I wanted that to fit into my life. Um, the more literal uh, and I think visceral manifestation of that was just the fact that girls have to get married young and that it's like, okay, you're 21, you have two, two more years to find a spouse before you're over the hill. And, you know, here are the, the three guys that we think are okay. And, you know, you don't like any of them. So ultimately you become trapped. And I saw it with other people. I saw it with my friends. I saw it with other people in my community. I saw it with my friends who were not Persian, but also first generation American. And so uh, my feeling was that wedding dress is just as much of a straight jacket as a celebratory thing. And so I made this um, straight jacket wedding dress, which turned into a performance. So these are some of my colleagues from Cranbrook who are pinning me down. There's like these little tabs on the bottom of the dress and they pinned me down to the floor and sort of wrapped me up. And it was my job to get out of that. So that was the live performance. You know, there are lots of other pictures in here, but this is sort of, you know, where it ended up. And then it ended with me sort of fleeing out the window. Um, but, you know, this theme I think is, is a theme that reached a lot of people, even if they're not Persian, because it's, I think you can just look at the clothing and know right away what that represents. So that's the good thing about clothing. And of course, the opposite or inverse of Persian marriage is Persian divorce, which is as prevalent in the in this community now, both in Iran and in America, as it is for Americans. Um, so a lot of those marriages, you know, that lasted 10 years or lasted eight years or lasted 15 years and then ended in divorce. And so this is my sort of, uh, I don't know, requiem, if you will, for Persian <laughs> marriage. Uh, so this is the disillusionment dress when you get divorced, it's called a dissolution, um, at least in California. And um, this was sort of the fake wedding, which was actually a divorce. I have a little book that I made called Googling Iranian Divorce in California, because I actually like Googled it. And I found so many links about these very contentious divorces. I don't know what it is with our community. We're very dramatic, but we seem to have very like not amicable divorces in general. Um, and then the embellishment on the gown, which, you know, was all handmade, was legalese from divorce documents. So, you know, it looks very pretty on the outside, but when you look closely, you start to see that the 
the negative words are printed in red and the legal words are printed in green. And so I use the red and green theme, which incidentally red, white, and green are the colors of the Iranian flag also. And I had a whole performative and participatory element again with the audience where they could create these little flowers. And I left a little tutorial, the tutorial you can see on the left. Um, people would write out their story on the green leaves and on the red flowers and cut it out and put it on these little wires and stick it in the dirt that I had created around the figure. So I think it was therapeutic for a lot of people, I have to say. Um, and then the other theme that comes up quite a lot is uh, the theme of destiny and um, divination. These are both things that have always fascinated me, <clears throat> but not just me. I think everyone, as I found through exhibiting this type of work. Um, this piece is based on an experience I had with bibliomancy. If you've never heard of it, bibliomancy is divination using a book. So one of our great mystic poets, whose name, who's simply known as Hafez, wrote a divination book. He has over a thousand poems. You ask Hafez a question, you open the book, and he gives you an answer. Sorry. You're fine. Take a moment if you need it. Everybody, we've gotten several people <laughs> in the um, chat just really commenting on uh, just how beautiful things are, breathtaking, pretty. Um, Dion just yeah. was mentioning earlier that each of your artworks are putting uh, together, or each of your artworks are put together well. The stories are clear to understand as the audiences um, engage with what they're seeing, even those who are not familiar with Persian uh, art and culture. So it's definitely uh, reading well to everybody that's here. So <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad to hear that because I always worry if I use Persian language in particular, if it's going to be like ostracizing to people who can't read it. So um, I go back and forth between Persian and English. But with this one, I just picked two lines and a key word from the poem because I in this period where I was figuring out what to do with my life, I got the same poem three times, which is rare in a book of a thousand poems. I got the same poem three times in a row. And the poem was, the lost and wandering Joseph will find his way back to Canaan, don't despair. Um, and it was really beautiful and the Persian's really beautiful. And the third time that I got it, I was actually in Iran at the tomb of Hafez and his descendant, got that poem from me. So it stayed with me. I mean, this is like 10 years after that. And I thought I've got to, I've got to do something with this. It was in my brain for 10 years. Um, so this was my lost and wandering. So the lost and wandering Joseph will return to Canaan. This was my Joseph. This is, uh, this Devore is printed with the outline of Joseph fleeing from Potiphar's wife as she grabs his coat. It's a very famous scene. Joseph is in the Old Testament and he's in the Quran. Um, so if you don't know the story, he's the son of Jacob, the one with the multicolored coat, <laughs> same Joseph, gets sold into slavery. And then he's bought out by this, the amorous wife of, wife of Potiphar who keeps trying to seduce him. And he keeps, he wants to be chaste and he wants to be a good person. And this is from a scene of her grabbing his coat when he tries to escape her seduction. But it's the outline of the scene. So it's, again, it's just kind of like the essence of that. And on the panels is written gomgashte, which means lost and wandering. Um, the destiny theme, as I mentioned, comes up a lot. And I have found that it is probably the most powerful connection that I've had with any audience. Love stories and destiny. I mean, everyone understands these things. Everyone can care and relate about these things. So in 2007, I created for a live performance at the San Jose Museum of Art, a work that I called Destiny House. I mean, there is no such thing as a destiny house, but I made it. So it's silk panels and um, I invited people in. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
and they ask their questions. I'm talking too much. Hold on. You guys talk. <laughs> well, um, I know Paige in the chat, actually, I, there was a question I was going to ask later, but um, was noticing that there's kind of a barrier made around um, the red garment um, with the paper plates. There was a barrier as well with the central garment. Does this occurrence of the hanging barrier around the garment have any particular meaning to you? It, it definitely feels like there's um, continued relationships between like the body and the constructed environments that you're creating. Can you, I don't know, do you want to talk about that? Or we can also keep uh, looking at things in the chat if you want. <laughs> Sure, I'll try not to choke on my own story. <laughs> there, I'm sure. sure. <laughs> was this the piece that she yeah, was I think, this is, I think this is one of several. Yeah. So, yeah. But we were just kind of noticing that it felt, it felt like a recurring theme in your work. So, it is. It's the, the lone figure in an empty space or in a space where you're waiting for something to happen. Um, that to me is what you see when you look at these Persian miniatures you are essentially looking at a moment in a story. But for me, I want my viewer to, to tell the story for themselves. So that is something that comes up a lot. Definitely the relationship of the body and space, but also the enclosure. Certain installations are very open and they're meant for the viewer to enter, um, like this one. But other ones are deliberately closed off, and that is about like, I think a feeling of isolation and a feeling of loneliness and a feeling of like me wanting the viewer to not only experience the story of the figure, but also to put themselves in the place of the viewer. So it's kind of like the willful suspension of disbelief that we all experience if we're watching a film or a theater or something where you kind of, you relate so deeply with the character that you become them and you, you worry for them in a way. And so I think there's an element of that. How successful it is, I don't know, you have to ask the viewers. <laughs> um, but this was, um, this was another event where I had people come in, they would write a question anonymously and they would tuck it into the ribbons on the outside of this enclosure. So this is the view of that. <clears throat> These are Hafez lines. This is like a double walled layer. Um, and they would tuck their little questions in here and they asked the most serious questions. I mean, I just thought this would be a really interesting event. People took this so seriously. They were queuing up outside the museum. I did not, I couldn't move for like the three hours of the whole event. I sat there the whole time and did destiny readings. And I made my own book of Hafez. I translated the poems to English. Um, um, you know, I loved, I like to write anyway, and I like to make books and I like the idea of books, but this one became a pretty integral aspect of the performance here because they were actually asking questions and I was actually interpreting for them without knowing the question. So that's another piece I think that is important is that people were asking these serious questions because they could, because they, they could be anonymous about it and they could sit with me and I could give them the answer to, and most of them said, yeah, you really answered my question, which is amazing when you don't know the question, but that's how Hafez is. He speaks through you if you are his, if you're connected to him. And so I think if you read enough of these Persian poets, you see how the poet itself, the poet themselves is a vessel for the divine. And then you become a vessel for the for the mystic poet as well. It's a really beautiful sort of transformative thing that happens. But it, it was just, it was a lovely thing. So this is the line, just part of the line of people that were there. It was pretty amazing. Um, in 2015, I got an NEA grant and I worked with the Westchester Arts Council. So by this time I'm living in New York. Um, the art scene in New York is very different than the art scene in California. But my curator that I worked with really liked that piece. And she asked me to work with that idea and make a new piece. And so this was the piece that I made. And um, the garment here, in the garment, you can see there's this really bright red interior and there's this kind of grayed out overgarment. And on the back of the garment, I have um, connections of a red thread going to a hundred different Hafez poems. So I had done my own destiny for a hundred days and I recorded each of those poems 
and hung them on the wall. And then I had a red dot on sort of the, the most significant word in the poem and connected to the red dot was a thread that connected to the red in the garment. I'll see if I have a, I hope I have a view of the back. There's the detail of the poems and the connections. I don't think I had a detail, sorry, my bad. But you could see on the side view, all these threads connecting the, the person to the wall. <clears throat> so on the one hand, it was bloodlines, you know, me being connected to my Persian history. But on another level, it was like, she was stuck. She was like held back in a way by her fate. Um, so, you know, there are lots of different interpretations though. And I heard them from, you know, I heard really in interesting interpretations from different viewers and I'm fine with all of it. Um, these are the questions that I got. I took them and I stitched them together because I had them writing on rice paper and I made like a giant wall, but this is just a little detail of that. Um, in 2013, I, I was still kind of bicoastal because I hadn't been in New York that long. So I was working with museums and organizations still in California. And uh, the museum, in, a museum in the South Bay in Los Gatos asked me to curate a show of Iranian American artists. And I was also in the show. So this was my installation in that show and it's called Prince and Dervish. And it's really about the inner self and the outer self. Uh, the blue with the gold being the outer self, which is the prince, and the inner dervish is represented by the green. And these two garments um, were connected by a thread that went through the installation. And these are just some details here. This is um, another Hafez poem, um, and it's about like the dervish garment and how it's wine stained. So the, the two line from Hafez was last night I went to the tavern sleep addled with the hem of my dervish garment soaked and wine stained. It's really beautiful in Farsi, but it's uh, one of the harder ones to translate. Um, when I was leaving California, I tried to do the traditional gallery thing where you make wall pieces. And I have to tell you, I don't think that's my work. It's just, it's, I'm not a 2D wall framed. I mean, there are some things I've made like that. But this was part of this series that I did when I was working with the gallery. And, um, you know, they were popular, but I feel like I just need to work bigger. At any rate, this little series um, is part of uh, a series about Persians in the news. So it was like good news and bad news. Um, this was about the earthquake in Bam. Uh, there was a story about a man who lost his daughter and his daughter's name was Nazanin. So I, it's called Namesake. Um, this is homage to shooting a body who won the Nobel Prize in 2003. Um, this is another sort of princess poem. And this one was about the Patriot Act. And I have, you know, so Safavid figures contemplating the Patriot Act. So you can see it's like multi layered. These are all multi layered on a frame. And you have suspicions, tensions. These are all embroidered on there. And then in the back, you have the Safavid tulips and in the front, the Safavid figures. Um, but at least for the last 10 years, I've been working a lot more with digital drawing. I've always worked with CAD and technology, but um, you know, as the tools get better, it gets to be much more fun and much more rewarding. So I think from the time I got my first iPad, maybe 2011, I started drawing a lot more and I've been making sort of my own Persian miniatures. So these are just some snapshots of those. Again, I don't work in 2D a lot, but um, this series is about Persian women. It's called Collective Unconscious. And each woman is uh, named after a, a woman in Persian narrative story. Um, and then here I took one of them. This is the Layla figure or Leili as we call her in Farsi. And I turned her into a little jacquard design and I wove her. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite pieces because I finally got to weave my own figural textile which is much harder than it looks, by the way. But it was a good experience. And um, it, it shows you, I think, how you can sort of start to think about melding um, old and new techniques and old and new ideas um, and using technology in a way where it's not, it doesn't look like a digital piece per se. Um, moving on with my series of, you know, Safavid women, 
This particular piece is based on a 17th century velvet um, from what is the largest corpus of Safavid velvets, and it's now in the Rosenborg Palace collection. It was a diplomatic gift in the 17th century from Iran to uh, the Holstein Gottorp. And so um, I did a little drawing based on this figure. This was another, there's a book on this also by Carol Beer. And um, I made her my own, you know, she was my inspiration, but I made her my own and she became the talisman that I wanted to wear. And so I made a gown, the gown, uh, the over gown is the supplicant figure. She's in a traditional pose of supplication and the gown underneath has roomy poetry. And then this is the performative still from that work. So this is me as the supplicant in the same figure as the supplicant. And this was taken in California. When I go to California, I always feel like I'm sort of at peace. So um, that was my feeling there is that she's kind of protecting me and giving me that inner peace. My feeling sometimes in New York is very different. Um, the talismans that we need, I think to get through life every day, um, vary for everyone, but there was a period of time in the early modern period where it became really popular to actually wear verses of the Quran or verses of mystic poetry under your clothes, like as an undershirt, as a protective layer. And this was just one of the things that I researched. I wrote an article on it. If you wanna read it, it was published in 2019 in the Journal of Textile Design Research and Practice. And, um, but the idea really struck me. So you can see, I. I had started working with this idea of the talisman, but um, here I took it to sort of a different level. I mixed it with this idea of wanting to explore technology and I made a smart garment with a sensor. Um, and this is definitely how I feel sometimes in New York where if people come too close, it turns red. And if they're sort of in that median zone, it's yellow. And if they're far enough, it's green. And there are different modes, you know, it just depends how you code your microcontroller. Um, but this is part of my talismanic garment series. Um, and then the final piece in this series was, um, it happened to coincide with COVID, but I actually planned the piece before COVID. Um, and this happens with a lot of my pieces as they come into my head and then they become relevant a year later. I don't know what, what's going on there, but um, I had this, this sort of feeling that I wanted to create a protective piece for my oldest daughter. So this is my oldest daughter wearing the piece that I made for her. Um, and I had originally created it where it was like three foot diameter from her body. So she had that proverbial six feet of separation that they told us to have during COVID initially. Um, but it got kind of squished in the box as it went over there. So it's much smaller now. But my idea was that she's enveloped in this cape, which is essentially a prayer, like a cloud of words. Because whenever we would go out the door, my mom would say a prayer for us and she would blow it all around us like a force field. And so this was sort of my force field for my daughter who's going to school in California. And underneath is this little design that I made for her because she's studying psychology. And these are all of her thought bubbles. And I filled the text with all of her text messages to me, all of the great things she said. Um, so that was kind of fun. And just to come around full circle, believe it or not, my newer body of work that I'm planning out that I don't have much to show for it yet is right back to the dervishes in the garden. Unbelievable. So I'm back to the dervish robe and all of what it means. I've done a whole lot of research. Um, my book that's coming out um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to show you in the next slide, which is this book in the middle, has a whole chapter on the dervish robe and what it means. And it explores this idea of the figure and what it means to wear these narrative scenes on your outer cloak in the Safavid period and the kinds of mystic messages that are conveyed. Um, so this is coming out soon. Um, earlier this year, and the other side of my work, I published a book, a book on Western fashion. And that goes all the way from Victorian crinoline to digital design and virtual couture. So if you're interested, that's an easy book to pick up on Amazon. You can do it, you know, Kindle or whatever. Um, and then I'm working on a third book with a, a, a small group of scholars. We're working on immigrant labor in clothing and textile production. 
because for those of you who don't know, the ready to wear industry was largely built on the backs of immigrants, especially in New York, but even in Paris as well. So that's another area where I, I've been exploring more. It goes from the early modern to the postmodern period. And that's pretty much it. Yay, Nazanin, that was amazing. Uh, incredible to just see that entire span of work from um, all the way from the 90s to now. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing all of that. We do have a number of questions in the chat um, that are coming in. There's also lots of love coming in. Um, but one, actually, <laughs> there was um, one question that was recently asked was about that shift to 2D digital art. And I think we also have just a lot of students I know um, in the room at the moment that are in the digital textile design. And I'm curious about like, um, obviously when you first started creating work, that wasn't really an option, but like how the language of handmade textiles like if you could just talk more about that shift and then also like how the language of handmade kind of for hand processes has informed the work with the the digital kind of um, uh, digitally printed things that you're doing right now. So I love that question because it really envelops everything in this program that I'm building at CUNY right now. Our program at City Tech is business and technology of fashion. Um, and so my goal for my students is to have them learn these digital technologies but my philosophy is that you can't possibly understand CAD unless you know how the fabric is made in the first place. To me, the computer and all of this technology is just a tool to make your job easier and faster. And easier and faster is really, that's been the goal for fashion for a long time. And so I would say as an artist, I like the, the precision I can get with the digital drawing over trying to screen print. Like you can see the difference between the Prince and Dervish print, which is just a mono print, and the kind of specificity and detail I can get with, you know, with the piece. Let me go back a couple slides. Like this one, the Rosenborg piece, right? Because I mean, it's it, no one's been able to do a textile that looks like a drawing since the Safavid period. That was one of their specialties. And I don't have the skill to do that. I have lots of skills, but I'm not that skilled. Like that's a lost art for the most part. So, I mean, why not? Use the digital tools where they help you, but you don't wanna lose the fabric. You don't wanna lose the haptic quality that you get from textiles because it's very special. And we are in the end, even though we live online, we also live in our bodies and we also, appreciate the feel of textiles. And don't forget the kind of energy that objects can hold. If you have you know, a, a best friend and that best friend gives you their shirt, that's gonna end up being your favorite shirt because it, it, whether you know it or not or think about it or not, it's the energy of your friend that's with you and it's the closest thing to your body is always the thing that you're wearing. So all of these are reasons I think why we're not gonna lose textiles and shouldn't lose textiles. That said, you should always, I think, embrace technology because it makes, it, it just expands the possibilities for how you can print, how you can weave, how you can express your ideas, how you can fabricate things in a more, um, you know, in a less time intensive and labor intensive manner because textiles are very labor intensive. So if we can speed it up a little, I think that's okay. Thank you for that. Um, another um, just kind of process-based question from a little bit earlier. Um, Annan was mentioning that uh, love love that you stitched the map to find your way in an early piece. Could you talk more about the connection in your work between drawing with thread and the and a line of poetry? Oh my goodness, it's so funny because I was just um, Annan missed our group today. Annan, you missed our group today. We were just talking about this connection between poetry and textiles, and that is again, a huge interest of mine. I have a whole section of my book on that as well. When these poets describe poetry writing, they describe it as weaving a textile. And when you look at textiles from the Safavid period, the textiles are like meta textiles. They're self-referential. They'll say, I am the most beautiful garment housing this wonderful person underneath the cloak. It's really interesting how they anthropomorphize these objects. And so that idea to me 
is the connection between words and textile. It's right there. It's in the word text. Uh, our word for text comes from the Latin texere, which means to weave. Um, and in Persian, it's a very similar thing. So sherbafi and sherbafi are the, the same thing. Brocade weaving and poetry weaving are literally like those are the phrases that correlate. Um, so that textile making is always a metaphor for telling a story. Um, but as far as the map, I mean, there wasn't enough time and enough, like I would bore everyone to death, but I had a whole series of maps also from the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and even, you know, more recently, I'm sort of like obsessed with maps because I do see them as a metaphor for fate and a metaphor for finding your way in life. And, um, and I just love the image of maps. I love that sort of two-dimensional aerial view. So yeah, I think all these things are more interconnected than we think. And the more we look at them, the more we see those connections. Um, Aaliyah had, um, I think it's almost more of like a, a comment question, but I, I love how your art is so influenced by your life and culture. How else could we process such overwhelming beauty and sadness other than by art? <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> followed up with that, I think um, Terry was asking, what inspired you to use messages of poetry inserted into your creations? I love how it helps to tell a story and at times show a metaphor. Yes. Um, you know, I go back and forth between whether I have a story or I have just a word or I have just an image. And I think I, I go through phases, even with my own production, where I'm full of words or I'm full of images. And they're not usually at the same time. I go through these very productive periods where I make a huge amount of art. But the last two years, I've done a huge amount of writing. Now I'm ready to shift back to art. So, you know, if you call me in three years, I should have like six new installations for you. Um, but, you know, I, I think that I like the idea of having a word as a touchstone. I particularly like using Farsi, A, because it's beautiful, B, because it's meaningful, and C, because it just, the language is so subtle. Like the, the idea is that, are embodied in one phrase. Like some of these phrases in Farsi, like gomgashte, I described it as lost and wandering, which I think is fair, but you could almost write like three sentences on what gomgashte actually means. And so I love that the culture and the cultural idioms are so complex that you can, that you can actually sum up these huge ideas in a word or in a phrase. So that's really interesting to me as well. Um, I was, I mean, sort of building off of just the the tech, like just conversations about text. I think one thing that I was noticing and interested in was how much you engage audiences with text um, in terms of like, not only in just sort of engaging with your work and the text that you're sort of putting out there, but also just having them uh, actually write things and 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 sort of be have that be part of the process. And I think that, um, uh, I don't. I don't know actually if you know this, but one of the we, PSU is fairly well known for our art and social practice program. So we do actually have a lot of students that are like constant. They're really thinking about um, meaningful audience engagement as part of their work. And I'm curious about as you create those kinds of um, experiences where you're collaborating with the audience. Like, what what is some of the thinking that goes into that um, in terms of thinking about both like how you frame that experience and then um and also to a certain extent like the lack of control you have over the outcomes of some of those experiences yeah you know i'm happy to say i have very rarely had sarcastic or like flippant things come out of an audience i mean if they do then they do that's that's part of it right some people are going to be rude or they're going to be whatever um but i try to i try to give my viewer a prompt and I try to make it something where if they're not interested they can walk on but if they are interested it gives them an outlet I mean I think this idea of having art perform a social function and perform um you know help people in some way this is really appealing to me I'm not a psychologist I'm not a doctor both my parents are in medicine we've got a lot of doctors and I always felt 
you know, I want to help people, but that's not my way of working with them. You know, I have a different way of doing that. But if seeing something or writing something or experiencing something can invoke a, a feeling of peace or a feeling of connection, I think most of us feel pretty alone most of the time. And so my ultimate goal is you can tell your story. You don't have to sign it. You can put it in an envelope or you can stick it in this corner. I, I think the anonymity is really important. And I think that's also why Web3 has been exploding is that people have a platform now. But for me, it's still very much like, I like the tangibility of writing and um, being able to, <clears throat> to add to, excuse me, a large piece or an installation. So I don't know if that answered the question, but it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely my way of both wanting to connect with people and wanting them to have a positive experience or a positive takeaway from interacting with my work. Yeah, Aaliyah says, in regards to if there was a flippant response to your artwork, I would imagine you are simply presenting the resistant viewers with something that they are not ready to hear or understand. I am a longtime fan, so I'm biased. <laughs> but oh, I, yeah. I guess I, 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 actually, I've never gotten anything negative, but um, one thing that, that made my husband really laugh hard was once for in the dissolution mint dress. Um, one of the messages to me was like, I'd marry you in a hot Iranian minute or something. <laughs> like very like, whoa, but it was funny. It was funny. It wasn't like, it wasn't like mean or rude. It was just, we just all started laughing. I have no idea who left it. They left it when I wasn't there, but it was, you know, looking through those sometimes that's also part of it. You know, that's just like, it's okay. Even if they did write something silly, I mean, but most people don't. If people are seeking art, they're seeking it out for a reason. And if they're interacting with your art, they're they're doing it because they want something meaningful to come out of it. I've rarely had an issue otherwise. Um, um, I think we'll have Carmen's question just kind of be our last one because we are going to be losing people soon. But do you consider the people who engage with um, your social pieces to be collaborators, participants, or something else? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that properly speaking, they are participants. If I work with another artist on something, then that's a collaborator. Not that, not that the audience isn't collaborating when they add to the piece, but um, it's more of a participatory role because I'm setting it up for them and they're just participating or not participating. Um, any advice to non-Muslims on how or if you should use Persian motifs or Islamic culture? I love hijab, history of head covering but it's a loaded subject. Yes, that is a tough one. I really appreciate that question. I personally think, I think that there's a lot being made of cultural appropriation and people like to see things that aren't there sometimes, like they, like, oh, you stole this from whatever. But the fact of the matter is, if you looked at textile history, everybody is looking at everybody's work, okay? So there are Chinese motifs and Persian textiles and Persian motifs and Indian textiles and Indian motifs were made in you know, Britain. And all of these things went into like William Morris arts and crafts movement. And then that made its way to America. So everybody's looking at everybody's art. I think it's okay to be inspired. I think that's different than appropriation. So I would say aim for inspiration rather than appropriation. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in hijab, figure out what that means for you. Um, and by the way, women of all religions and all cultures covered their heads in the ancient world from Greece and Rome to Mesopotamia and, you know, Jewish women, Christian women, Muslim women. It, that's not a thing that was invented with Islam but they're the only group that has actively held on to it. So, you know, explore it if you're interested in it, but start with the history and, and take it from there because I did find that doing a lot of research helped me flesh out my own ideas as an artist in a much more meaningful way. So I hope that helps. Um, and I, I can say that is absolutely one of the things that um, I, I don't feel like we touched on enough in this work today, but I just, I think that, um, uh, I mean, you can see just in the incredible body of writing um, work that you've done, especially over the past couple of years, that like um, all of your work is really steeped in research in a, in a really meaningful way. And um, 
And I think that like, you know, I, I can't say enough to, you know, students in terms of thinking about like really understanding, you know, just what, what it is that you're working with as far as imagery and whatnot. Um, and then that will, that will oftentimes answer a lot of those questions. So. Yes, I agree. <laughs> thank you so much, Allison. It was really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will just folks, um, this will be, um, this conversation will be available on our archive next week. So um, students, you will have access to it if you want to go back and revisit any of the things that we talked about. Um, just thank you so much for joining us, Nazanin, and thank you everyone Your else. Questions. So um, we'll go ahead and stop the recording and um, sign off for today. Thank you.